Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. Let's talk about Universal-style games, be they in the form of GURPS, Hero, Fate, Savage Worlds, and so on. Universal-style games are intended to be used in as many potential genres as possible. Given that I've, for the most part, avoided discussing these types of games in this series, it'd be natural to assume I don't care for them. That's not entirely the case. I don't have anything against them per se, but they're not exactly what I go for 9 times out of 10. See, I prefer having something tailor-made for a specific style, or within a certain umbrella. A case in point is Fantasy Craft, a game I'll be getting to later, which is meant to portray a variety of fantasy games, but little outside that umbrella. It's this umbrella-style universality that brings us to our current topic, what's old is new, which I will call Woween for the sake of my sanity. Originally, Woween was split into two types of play, old for fantasy games and new for futuristic games, with now being added for more modern play. The central idea was to create three separate genre umbrellas that can have their mechanics interchanged. How does it hold up? Let's find out. Wolverine's three rulebooks have a solid presentation, though I do think the borders are a bit too big in a lot of cases, at least when looking at the complete books. See, in a weird case from other games, I need to talk about how the PDFs are presented to me. Because Woween is intended to have an interchangeable nature in its mechanics between the three eras, there are plenty of PDFs of separate chapters along with the full-size book. This resulted in some confusion on what was included in the core books and what was an expansion to them. While it isn't as much of a problem now, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it. Character creation reigns largely the same across all three eras, but we'll be using Old exclusively with our elven musketeer Anduil. The first step is the starting attributes, which all start at 3 with the exception of Magic and Reputation, which start at 0. Step 2 is Race, which grants a relevant set of attribute adjustments, 3 racial skills, and all of its racial exploits. We'll be going with Grand Elf. This gives us a plus 2 modifier to Agility and Logic, minus 2 to Luck, a plus 3 in Magic, and a rank in Swords, Muskets, and Intimidate, as well as the Grand Elf exploits, going with Fire as our free magical secret for it. Step 3 is Careers. We have 5 career ranks in total, 1 in an origin, and 4 more in further careers. Each career pick grants a set of attribute modifiers, a rank in 2 listed skills, and either a career exploit or a universal exploit. We'll go with Noble as our origin career, and Musketeer, Gladiator, and 2 grades in Fire Mage. This makes our final attribute out to be Strength 3, Agility 9, Endurance and Intellect 4, Logic 8, Will 3, Charisma 8, Luck 3, Reputation 2, and Magic 6. We also have the following skills. Dodging 4, Swords 3, Muskets 3, Intimidate 3, Evocation 2, and Perception 2. Exploit-wise, we go with the following. Silver Spoon, Quick Reload, Flaming Touch, Firebolt, and Gladiator's Cut. Outside of careers, we gain three additional exploits. Aim and one universal exploit we qualify for. In this case, we'll go with Deadly Strike as well as a trait from either our highest or lowest attribute. In our case, that's Agility, which will grant us Ambidextrous. Step 4 is the Derived Stats, in particular Movement and Defenses. For Movement, we have a Speed of 12, a Climb and Swim of 6, a Horizontal Jump of 18, and a Perception Roll of 3d6. We also have an Initiative Roll of 2d6 plus 1. For Defenses, our Melee and Range Defense is 18, Mental Defense is 11, and for the final part, we have 39 health and 18 magic points. The last step is equipment. We have 1600 GC to spend due to our noble origin. While our racial pick grants us a musket and our origin grants us superior quality clothing, we'll be spending some of the gold on a rapier, saber, high quality studded leather armor, articulated gauntlets, and 100 bullets. This leaves us with 1178 gold coins. Character creation is a lot simpler than it would appear, but there's a couple things about it that bug me. First, because of how attributes are related to dice pools, it kind of devalues singular increases. I think that adding pips a la West End D6 might help alleviate this. Secondly, it appears that when going down career paths, you can only take universal exploits when taking a first rank or when you've acquired all of a given career's exploits. I don't really understand why this is the case, even if universal exploits can be purchased outside of careers. So, mulligan? 
Woeing uses a d6 pool system, with the rolled dice added and compared to a target number. This pool is generated by an attribute and skill combination, but a character's grade determines the maximum dice pool that can be rolled. Luck can be considered the game's extra effort mechanic, since that attribute's dice pool isn't rolled in the same way. Instead, luck die are spent on effects such as adding die to attribute checks, damage, or is spent on bonus actions. It should also be noted that luck die used in this way explode on d6s. While the die cap might be considered a problem in most cases, Woeing takes advantage of it by allowing you to spend your die roll to activate exploits or effects. The basic usage of this is spending two die to add one die to damage. Some exploits like knockback require spending dice to activate their effects. The intent here is that characters will eventually have bigger dice pools than they can feasibly roll, and these dice can be offloaded into effects so as not to waste them. Criticals primarily occur during combat when an attack roll generates three sixes. When this happens, the attack is considered to put the target one step along a relevant status track. Now the status tracks are an interesting way of how Woween handles condition. Each condition has a set of degrees to represent that effect's severity. Mild, moderate, severe, and extreme along with an attribute that can be used to, to shake off effects, reducing or removing them. To use Anduil as an example, his Gladiator's Cut exploit allows his strikes to inflict the bleeding track. The first step is Bloodied, which has no effect. Next is Wounded, which inflicts one damage any time that target takes a second action. The third step is Bleeding, where they lose one health every turn. And the last step is Hemorrhaging, where they lose 1d6 health every turn. The d6 die pool is fairly well done here, barring my issue I mentioned earlier. While I don't have any problems with it per se, I do think its mechanical usage leans a bit too much towards combat. Your mileage may vary on that kind of situation. I think this is because the means of buying dice leans towards that more than anything else. This could be a consequence of the game's lack of detail in all but a handful of skills such as alchemy and leadership. Given the potential skill list, I don't think it can get away with that. Speaking of skills, the way the game handles subtypes of skills instead of a specialization system creates a situation where skill bloat could very much happen since it's assumed you're going to be buying in multiple skills separately. Woeing's Trinity has some degree of supernatural mechanics, or extra human if you want to get technical. Old has magic, new has psionics, and now has chi. We'll start with the magic system. Magic is the most detailed of the three, but it's still a degree of freeform. For starters, the magic attribute details magic rolls as well as the magic point pool that they have, being three times their attribute score. Instead of a standard spell list, players can create spells in a verb-noun format. The verb is the type of spell used, while the noun is the source of the effect. The latter is tied to magical secrets. Secrets include spell elements like fire, air, lightning, water, or creatures like fey or insect, and so on. Essentially, secrets are power words that tie a spell's effect. When it comes to verbs, these range from abjure, evoke, summon, infuse, and so on. Each verb has a suite of different effects that can be used on spells, as well as a set of associated secrets. The spell can be further customized by modifying the duration, range, area of effect, and casting time. Even with this, casting a spell still requires a secret and a relevant skill. New uses psionics instead of magic, which has a structure slightly less detailed. For starters, your pool of psionic points is determined by rolling the respective dice pools from psionics and will. This effectively is your cap. Psionic powers are treated as a subtype of universal exploits, and each spends a number of points equal to its requirement. That said, plenty of them have additional effects if you spend extra to activate them. Now utilizes Chi, reflecting upon Now's expansion of martial arts. You gain a set of Chi points based on the number of dice in your Chi pool, so a 46 die pool will have 4 Chi points. Furthermore, Chi points are utilized in stances, which are learned as universal exploits that cost 1 Chi point to activate for one round. Your maximum number of stances is limited to your chi point maximum. Magic is undoubtedly going to be the most daunting, especially to those used to traditional spell lists. Thankfully, there is a short list of spells in the book to provide a foundation on the matter. I like that skills are important to spell casting, but the skill bloat issue I mentioned before rears its head here. Psionics certainly works as a more freeform affair. I think it could use an easier form of point recovery or some more usage of skills and power use, as it only seems to apply to certain powers. It's not bad, just a little scattershot. Lastly, Chi is, in my opinion, underutilized, especially compared to the beta version. I understand not wanting it to be like the other two, but I think the pendulum swung too far the other way in making them mere stances. I might be a little biased, but I very much preferred the playtest version where each type of Chi had associated stance and Chi techniques. I think there's greater potential in combining these two setups. 
Wolene casts a large net. Multiple nets if you want to get technical. And I think it accomplishes its goal for the most part. If there's one problem it has as a whole, it's consistency. I appreciate the extra systems added to each era, but some of them have more detail than others. I highlight the magic psionics chi relationship for this exact reason. In addition, I find the details on skills perplexing. It's as if the game wants to be skill-based, but at the same time can't fully commit to the level of detail that a skill-based game needs. If you want to see an example of what I consider a skill-based game, look at Shadowrun. This results in a situation borderline similar to that of Roll and Keep, where attribute increases are more valuable than skills. It's not as bad, but it is close. Now, it could be argued this is mitigated by the fact that it's not using a level-based system, but that's a bandage, not a fix. Even so, Wolverine is a game that is tailor-made for those who like to treat the mechanics of a game like Legos to make freestyle builds. And for that reason, I give the game a stamp of recommended. It's certainly raw in a few places, but I could see it easily tweaked to handle a variety of other styles. While it's not going to be as flexible as the heavy hitters in Universal games, it's a nice middle ground. Plus, any game that isn't bowing at the feet of spellcasters can't be all bad. Stay frosty.